Good morning and happy Sabbath. Today's verse is from John 4, verse 3 to 13 to 14. Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks water drinks the water of that I shall give them who never thirst, but the water I shall give them will come in fountain, the fountain of springing up into everlasting life. Good morning and happy Sabbath church. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And um, I would want to say thank you to Charity for the children's story. And thank you, Jordan, for reading our scripture for today. Um, I was touched by today's Sabbath. Uh, the Sabbath school lesson. We, we, we had some, Rory, I don't see her anymore. I think she must have taken Nyasha somewhere. She, 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 she actually delivered my sermon in brief. So for those who attended Sabbath school here, uh, the sermon has been said. And for those who didn't hear it, maybe I'll try and put it uh, as best as I can, but I think it was well put during Sabbath school. All right, I, I titled our sermon today as Life Towards Christ. Life Towards Christ. What we are going to come up and uh, try and look at is only four points. So at the end of uh, the sermon, we should be able to have grasped four items. And I will emphasize those four items at the end of it all. We can tend to many things for a fulfillment and purpose in life. But only Jesus will satisfy our soul. So we can do everything and anything in life. But at the end of the day, only Jesus will satisfy our souls. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Our Father in heaven, at this time, dear Lord, we ask you for your Holy Spirit to be with each and every one of us who is here. Lord, we come to you with heavy hearts. The heavy hearts that we have, Lord, you know them already. We've got problems in our lives. We've got trials that go through us. We are tried and tempted on a daily basis, Lord. We've got the young ones who are here with us who cannot pray to you, Lord. We ask you to be with them, guide them, and uh, protect them as they grow and give them a good life. Lord, we've got youth here with us also. We ask you to be with them. Be with them in their endeavors as they try in life, Lord, to be what you expect. Lord, we know there is so much that goes on in the world but with you, nothing is impossible. Lord, we've got the elderly who are not feeling well because of age. It's a good blessing, Lord. We thank you for that. And we've got those that are in hospitals not feeling well. Those also not feeling well, but at home. Lord, we ask you to be with them. You are the best physician. We know without you, we cannot get anywhere, but because you love us so much, and because of your grace, Lord, we are what we are. We thank you and ask you to be with us now. We pray this in the name of your Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'll ask one question which says, what gives you a, sen a sense of fulfillment or purpose in life? 
what gives you a sense of fulfillment and purpose in life. Very true. There are a number of things that might do that. Uh, the first being family. Secondly, we've got our jobs. Thirdly, we've got hobbies. And fourthly, we've got relationships. None of these are wrong, but they can easily disappoint you if you haven't made our Lord Jesus Christ your chief pursuit in life. So all these, which is family, jobs, hobbies, and relationships, they do help. But the main thing, let's not forget, is our Lord Jesus Christ. We heard from the children's story, the little ones, when they were asked, what is it that we need for this flower to bloom? They said, water, it needs food, it needs sunlight. And then they were also asked, what is it that we need as human beings? We need food, we need shelter, we need relationships. But most important of all, we need our spirit to be guided. Let's, let's maybe look at the jobs. You know, the, there was a certain man who went to a museum, and this museum was in the process of being constructed. So when this man got to the museum, he saw a sculptor making up uh, an image of a great king. So as this man was busy chiseling out, welding, painting, and doing everything else, uh, this gentleman sees another statue lying on the ground next to him, and he says, do you need two statues of the same image? And the sculptor says, no. And when he said that, no, he didn't even look at the gentleman. He continued doing his work. And he asks, if then you don't need to, why, why, why are you making another one? And the sculptor says, there is a scratch on the nose of the first image. And the gentleman goes on onto the statue, looks at it closely examines it from the toes to the head, examines it from the head to the toe, he could at least see no damage. And he says, really? Is there damage? And the sculptor says, yes, there is a damage. And the gentleman went on to ask, yeah, okay, you say there is a damage. Uh, where, where, where are you going to mount this sculptor? Where are you going to put this statue? Where is it going to be put? And the sculptor says, um, the statue is going to be mounted on a pillar, and that pillar is going to be about 20 feet, which is about 6 meters high, which is almost double that height, isn't it? So it will be right up there. And this gentleman then went on to ask the sculptor, if, if, if this statue is going to be mounted right up there, who is going to see that it's got a scratch on the nose? Why are you bothering yourself? At this stage, the sculptor stopped work, looked up at the gentleman, and smiled. And his answer was, I will know it. The sculptor is going to be 20 meters up there, no one else is going to see that is got a scratch, but the sculptor will know it. What do we learn from this? What we learn from this is the desire to excel is exclusive of the fact whether someone else appreciates it or not. Excellence is a drive from inside 
not outside. Excellence should not be intended for someone else to notice, but for your own satisfaction and efficiency. With this, we get our first point that we are going to go home knowing, and that is point number one, which says, don't climb a mountain with an intention don't climb a mountain with an intention that the world should see you. Climb the mountain with the intention to see the world. And to avoid disappointment, to avoid disappointment, make the Lord your chief pursuit in life. And with that, remember, only Jesus will satisfy your soul. So let's not forget and let's remember this point. Don't climb the mountain with an intention that the world should see you. Climb the mountain with the intention to see the world. Let's go to something that will lead us to our point number two, which is family. In the book of uh, Genesis, Genesis 23, verse 6, Genesis 23, verse 6, it reads, Yes, my Lord, you are a mighty prince among us. This was said by the Canaanites talking to Abraham. After weeping and mourning the death of her beloved wife, Sarah, Abraham got up and went to the people of Canaan. He asked the sons of Heth to give him the right to bury, to buy the field of Machapela so that he could bury his wife there. The dialogue between that people, which is the Canaanites, and Abraham was very interesting. They called him the Prince of God. This was a foreigner we had come. You remember what happened to Abraham? He, he, he left his country because the Lord had said to him, move out, Abraham, go somewhere. He didn't know where he was going. He went because he had faith in the Lord. And when he got to Canaan, after some time, his wife passed away. And now he wanted to bury his wife. This is why he went to the sons of faith to try and get a place where he could lay his beloved wife to rest. And in the, in the conversation between Abraham and the Canaanites, this is where they call him the Prince of God. Such was the respect they had for Abraham. Besides receiving him well, they also offered the field he had asked for at no cost. But Abraham chose and offered to pay for the field. Does not this teach us something? You are being given something for free. And you say, no, I'm still going to pay. And not only that, you are a foreigner in a certain land. And God has blessed you. In the process of being blessed, he did not put himself at the top. No, he humbled himself. Which is why they called him the Prince of God. Abraham did not call himself a prince, but he was called so by others. And as a true leader and a prince of God, he behaved as such, placing himself in the role of a servant before the people of the region. What a beautiful type of a Christ Abraham was in Canaan. And today, today us, 
here as we are at Amadeo Church. We also have the privilege of being witnesses for Christ. Just like Abraham was a witness of Christ, which is why they called him the Prince of God. Let's, let's, let's open up uh, the book of Acts. Acts 1 verse 8. Let me get my glasses. Acts 1 verse 8. Acts 1 verse 8 reads, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. This is what the disciples were told by the Lord, isn't it? And... Uh, Ellen G. White, in her book, Desire of Ages, page A22, expounded on that very same verse, and she wrote, Thus Christ gave his disciples their commission. He made full provision for the prosecution of the work and took upon himself the responsibility for its success. So long as they obeyed his word, and worked in connection with him, they could not fail. Go to all nations, he bade them. Go to the furthest part of the habitable globe, but know that my presence will be there. Labor in faith and confidence, for time will never come when I will forsake you. So, we, 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 we are being shown here that we've got such a loving father who promised and who still promises and who stays by his promise that he will never forsake us. We do sin. We do make mistakes, stupid mistakes at times. And some of those mistakes that we make at times, we also make them knowingly. But we are so fortunate that we've got a loving father who will never forsake us. What lesson do we get from this? The lesson we get from Abraham is may we choose to save more than to be saved. May we choose to save more than to be saved. Why? Because this is an attitude of a true prince of God. Let's look at uh, relationships. There is a lot of problems with relationships and you find as we struggle with relationships, there are times when we get trodden upon and when we have been trodden upon, we at times don't forgive, we at times don't want to let go. David, at some stage, he was being pursued by his enemies and he was in a cave and he wrote in the book of Psalms, Psalms 142, verse 2, and he says, I pour out my complaint before him. Before him, I tell my trouble. Who does he tell his trouble to? He tells it to the Lord. He tells it to the Lord. When you are tempted to sit around feeling sorry for yourself, Complaining about how unfair life is. Ask yourself a tough question. One tough question. And the question is, do I really want to get well? Or have I gotten comfortable with where I am in life? Which brings us to our point number three, which says... 
Don't ever let your setback become your identity. Don't ever let your setback become your identity. This, I'm putting it across to you, mainly youth. No matter what happens to you, no matter what trials you are going through, don't ever let your setback become your identity. And to put it bluntly, you have to get over that. Quit talking about it. Quit opening up that old wound time and time, ag- and time, and time again. You may have been severely wounded by a sour relationship, by a divorce, by the loss of a loved one. It's time to move on. Let go. Quit mourning about something you can't change. You must let go of shattered dreams if you want God to give you fresh and new dreams. Quit dwelling on your disappointment. Please, quit dwelling on your disappointment. They will not help you. Forgive the people who have hurt you. Keeping that hurt is only but just going to hate you even more. Release any remaining bitterness and God will definitely give you a new beginning. When uh, Jordan read uh, the scripture for us, he read from the book of uh, John. John 4. There we find uh, in John 4, Jesus was sitting at a well in the region of Samaria. There he met a woman who was vainly seeking fulfillment. And she had been married how many times? Five times. She had been married five times. And most likely, each broken relationship left her feeling more unloved than before. And each trial that we go through will leave us with a hurt heart. Each mistake anyone makes against us, each trial that we are being given will leave us wounded. But are we going to stay on that and stay on that forever? Are we going to make that our identity? No, not at all. Never ever. And you'll find as Jesus spoke to this lady, Jesus pointed to her her sin by revealing that she was now living with a man who was not even her husband. He wasn't being cruel, but instead he was helping her to recognize that she needed a savior. And that savior is none other than Jesus Christ. Every prior attempt to fill up her life had been futile. And now Jesus offered the only solution that truly fulfills, and that is himself. And we said, only Jesus will satisfy your soul. Which is why when this lady met up with the Lord, there is a time when she actually went and spread the word to the city where she came from. Why was she doing that? Because she had been fulfilled. She had got what is rightful for her soul. What does Jesus do? Jesus offers living water. Let's open the book of John again. Let's go to the book of John. John 4, verse 13 up to 14. John 4, verse 13 up to 14. And it reads, Jesus answered, 
let's start actually from, from, from verse 11. He says, the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? Who gave us the well and drank from it himself? As well as his sons and his livestock. So this lady knew very well that the well is really deep. And they had been drinking from it for a long time. But this man who was talking to her now is saying, I will give you living water. But when, he look, when she looked at him, he didn't, see her, he didn't see him with anything that he could go and get the water. And what does Jesus say to that? Jesus said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst. And not only thirst, he will thirst again. The water that we drink on a daily basis, the water that we give to the plants on a daily basis, will run out. But, verse 14, but, it says, whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. So the water that we get from the Lord, the water that we get from Jesus Christ is like a fountain. I, I like it the way Ellen G. White puts it in Desire of Ages, page 187. She wrote and said, the cisterns will be emptied. The pools become dry. But our Redeemer is an inexhaustible fountain. We may drink and drink again and ever find a fresh supply. He in whom Christ dwells has within himself the fountain of blessing a well of water springing up into everlasting life. From this source, he may draw strength and grace sufficient for all his needs. Do you, do you ever feel like the Samaritan woman? Dissatisfied with life and thirsty for love? Thirsty for a purpose or thirsty for fulfillment? If you are like that, this is where we will find our point number four. Point number four. Surrender to Jesus Christ and, for, and allow his life and love to flow through you. Surrender your life to the Lord. And once you surrender to the Lord, you will find you will become confident. You will become something, you will become someone who people look up to like what the Canaanites were doing when they looked at Abraham. He was the prince of God. Why? Because he had surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. And he had allowed his life, that is Jesus' life and love, to flow through his life. To flow in his life. When we look at those four points which I mentioned, the first one being, don't climb a mountain with an intention that the world should see you. Climb the mountain with the intention to see the world. Number two was, may we choose in our lives, may we choose to save more than to be saved. And number three is, 
don't ever, don't ever let your setback become your identity. And once you have said and you have, you have not let yourself, your, 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 your setback become your identity, do one thing. Surrender to Jesus Christ and allow his life and love to flow through you. And with this, only then will you experience the fullness of his promises. May God bless his word.